are deliberating a, I guess it was styled as a motion to dismiss in case number 20-043A. This is the Anna Oster matter, which originally was a request for variance. Um, this board issued an opinion and an order um, within 30 days of that opinion and order, timely filed motion to reconsider was filed by the petitioner. Um, that motion was deliberated um, approximately 30 days after it. This motion um, to dismiss, I believe in the case of fraud, it says, was filed around midnight, and then there was a corrected copy filed a little bit after midnight. So we have what's being called a motion to dismiss. As uh, rules of procedure for this board, I guess we do not have a mechanism for something called a motion to dismiss to happen in that time of hearing um, due to the pro se nature of the petitioner. I guess I'm looking at it again as a maybe second motion for reconsideration, which also our rules do not have any applicable guidance on how to handle same. Um, in my mind, trying to make uh, sense procedurally of where we are in this matter, I'm going to treat it as basically, um, it's obviously not within the 30 days for a motion for reconsideration. So I believe it's akin to basically what would Maryland rule 2-535B would be the revisory power of the court for fraud, mistake, and irregularity. Um, so judging it in that frame, um, basically if we were in a circuit court situation and such a motion were to be made, the standard of proof for a petitioner would be by clear and convincing evidence, and that is Davis v. Attorney General 187 Maryland App 110 2009 case, where it basically re-articulated the evidentiary standard. Looking at the allegations as it is so styled, fraud is the allegation. Um, and as uh, my colleagues might remember, as we sat in law school, um, there is two different types of fraud that um, come into a play when you're dealing with the revisory power of the court. Those two different types of fraud are extrinsic fraud and intrinsic fraud. Intrinsic fraud deals with basically things that came out during the case. Extrinsic fraud is fraud which basically provides or impedes due press process. I believe our civil procedures professor would basically saying someone tackling you at the courthouse steps um, not in letting you into the clerk's office for a filing. As Jones v. Rosenberg, 178 Maryland Act 54, 2008, has re-articulated, um, extrinsic fraud is the only type of fraud that applies when dealing with the revisory power of a court. Um, and I must reiterate, this is not in the board rules, but absent such rules that are applicable, reaching out to the guidance of the Maryland rules, um, I believe it is clear from the allegations presented, therefore, there is no extrinsic fraud that we are dealing with here. Um, the allegations deal with two things, basically the alleged um, uh, perjury of a witness or misstatements of a witness uh, concerning uh, a variety of factors within the hearing. Um, again, just putting on the record, it is our job during a hearing to hear testimony and to make decisions as fact finders as to the credibility of who is to be believed, which is always the charge of a fact finder when you have contradictory evidence that was presented. Um, one matter of clarification, as was stated in the board's opinion in the original case, the exhibits that were provided prior to the trial by the petitioner, though not all were shown during the hearing, all were admitted into the evidence and to the record and all were reviewed by the board members in making their determination. I believe there is reference to all of those exhibits as a whole in the, in the board's opinion. Um, second of all, I believe what I do recall, the evidence that was not allowed to get in, there was a request to, to call someone who might have some extra um, or other opinions. Um, that call was prohibited because 
that's just not how the board works. Basically, when you have your hearing, you have your witnesses or you do not. Um, again, I, I would state that this board is not omnipotent, nor is it without fault as any human could be. If there is a decision that has been made in error by this board, um, after a motion for reconsideration, the person or body to tell us that we have made a mistake is the circuit court for Baltimore County, um, which happens with regularity. We take the guidance from the circuit court and we act accordingly. It's my understanding that there has been at least an attempt at an appeal filed with the circuit court for this matter, which I believe is the proper venue for any other um, thoughts or arguments that are to be made with the, the board's ruling. So that's my thought on the matter. I would defer to my learned, learned colleagues if they would like to add other thoughts to this, or perhaps they disagree with my recitation of facts and law. I'd like to go next since I sat on this uh, panel with you uh, and state that I concur fully with you. I continue to be impressed with your preparation. I thought that I was going to have to go to the extrinsic versus intrinsic and I've got my annotations here, and, and, and since I already have them, I think perhaps for the benefit of Ms. Bonder, I'd like to cite just a couple that put a finer point on this distinction of extrinsic versus intrinsic, given her allegation in this uh, procedurally deficient motion to dismiss, in which she alleges that the expert for um, Ms. Oster Mr. Carballa uh, perjured himself. And the cases uh, in Maryland that address the revisory power uh, to 535 for fraud, I mean, yeah, for fraud, address this specifically and have said that, in fact, perjury, believe it or not, in the case is no basis uh, for fraud. That's intrinsic. So, as you pointed out, the distinction, the requirement for extrinsic evidence would be such that it prevented an adversarial trial. Clearly, no one can can contend that Ms. Bondar was prevented from an adversarial trial. Her allegation of perjury um, is, is routinely dealt with as extrinsic fraud and denied. An example is a claim that an employer's owner perjured himself by stating that the truck driver had no relationship with the employer at the time of the accident would have been intrinsic fraud. And that's Fork War versus Progressive Northern Insurance. Uh, that's actually a federal court case, 910 F sub second 815. Another case in determining whether extrinsic fraud exists for purposes of vacating a judgment. The question is not whether the fraud operated to cause the trier of fact to reach an unjust conclusion, which Ms. Bondera alleges, but whether the fraud prevented the actual dispute from being submitted to the fact finder at all, which of course didn't, didn't happen. Uh, Bland v. Hammond, 935A2, 457. And then lastly, since I have the book open, the question is not whether the fraud operated to cause the trier of fact to reach an unjust conclusion, but whether the fraud prevented the actual dispute from being submitted to the fact finder that city of college park versus jenkins 819 a second 1129 there's just just many examples of this so while sympathetic to her feeling aggrieved that is why we have appeals to the circuit court the issue of evidence allowed or not allowed you've addressed and again um, no matter the substance of that it's not a fraud irregularity or mistake within the revisory power and that's just subject to an appeal, and that's where uh, she'll have to seek her recourse. So I would deny her motion. Mr. Pennington, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, you two did a wonderful job. Um, I don't need to reiterate everything the two of you just said. I, I concur with both of you. Well, that being said, um, I guess we'll do a, a brief order just encompassing our recitation of Maryland Rule 535B and the revisory power um, of this board. And um, the matter will be in the hands of circuit court and they will let us know if we have further proceedings in light of their decision. Let me just add one thing, I'm sorry. 
for, for the purposes of, of, of this uh, ruling, I'm not commenting one way or the other on whether Ms. Bondar's allegation that Mr. Karbalik perjured himself or presented untrue testimony has merit. I'm simply pointing out that the court, the courts that have interpreted rule 2-535 have said, even if that's true, that's not a basis to exercise revisory power. So I wanted to make that clarification. All right, that clarification is noted and also um, I, I will join in that clarification. All right, gentlemen. Well, um, thank you for your time this morning. And uh, I guess uh, Tammy can, can end with the button on her side. So thank you all very much. All right. Thank you, sir. Have a good day. Thank you, gentlemen.